Hey everybody, it's the Big K Experience uh, right here on the B, and I got a special guest with me today, Chanel. How you doing, Chanel? I'm good. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm doing fantastic. You know, I just kicked this show back off, mm -hmm. right? Uh, last week or uh, last month, I mean, I was on with the medium and uh, she was talking to my wife and my dad. I found out that actually my mom and dad were doing the nasty right before he passed away. Oh, really? Did right? you confirm that? <laughs> yeah. Did you go back and confirm Yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> my mom confirmed it. The medium saw it, and then my mom's like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So, wow. And she's all blushing and acting crazy. Yeah, it was it was intense for me. I mean, like of all the things I've been through in my life, that had to be the most awkward I situation. I imagine. And I dressed up as a Cupid and walked through an office building, right? No phase. But finding out what your mom and dad were doing, oh, my God. If there's a way to go, though, it maybe respect the way the old man went. But uh, yeah, so I'm very blessed to be working with the B again. They're a news-based group, and uh, they report on a lot of things throughout the tri-state area. So I'm glad I got to bring in someone's experience from outside of the tri-state. Um, well, actually, Nevada is still technically the tri-state, but you're out in Las Vegas. All right. But tell me about your life, Chanel. What led you up to this kind of position? Let's, let's back up a whole bunch. What, what do you got going on? Yeah, so um, I, I'm a former drunk. <laughs> and now, <laughs> and now um, I help people who have food addiction. So a, a lot has happened in that in that window, you know. Um, so it, it's really hard to say where to start. Where do you want me to start? Well, let's just start with adulthood, right? Like, um, so I'm assuming things that happened had you since you had bariatric surgery, you had to be overweight prior, right? So have you been overweight your whole life? Yeah, I would say most time, most of my life I've been overweight. Like in middle school and high school, I was probably pudgier than the other girls. I was also like really top heavy. And I mean, this is back in the 90s where shit wasn't. Can I, sorry, can I swear on her? <laughs> well, it looks like it. We'll right. edit it. <laughs> and yeah, um, back in the 90s where, you know, we didn't have clothing like we have today, right? The market wasn't there like it is today. So I would always be shopping at late. Lane Bryant wearing, you know, like looking like a little junior executive going into middle school because um, they carried my size, you know, um, in high school. Same same thing. Now, when I like look at pictures of myself when I was younger, I was like, yeah, I wasn't that heavy as I probably thought I was in my head. But compared to my peers, I was. And then it just sort of progressed. I'm sure the drinking did not help my cause. Um, yeah. but yeah, by the time I was 38, I was, um, 270, 280 pounds. And then my highest was about 295, um, about a year after my son. Wow. And so, and that's something I think I fought with too, because I had, I like to say it's body dysmorphia, but I was, when I look at the pictures of myself back when I was a senior in high school, I remember thinking I was one of the fat kids, right? I was just like, Oh, I'm, a, I'm huge, but I look comparable now. <laughs> Definitely not that fat person I thought I was, right? Yeah. But I, according to my peers, like I said before, so it's all about perception, really, at that point in time. Uh, but I do feel like uh, I thought I had a big old belly on me, and so it was easier for me to gain more weight because I already thought I was there, right? Do you think you were in the same position? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was uh, by the time I was in my late twenties, early thirties, when I moved out to Vegas. I mean, I was just two fifty was just where I seemed to sit. That was just my weight all the time. And when I would diet, I could get down to like 225 and then I would quit and then I'd quickly back up to 250 because I always did these things that were just really extreme and didn't necessarily like, I hadn't come to, you know, a rock bottom moment yet on change um, with my, with how I ate because I wanted to have both sides of the, the world. I wanted to eat whatever I wanted and still be thin. And despite my efforts through Weight Watchers and Nutrisystem and um, those types of programs, which is really kind of what they sell is the idea you get to have both worlds. Um, it never, it never, they do, absolutely. Out. Yeah, it never panned out. And I, I always wondered for the longest time why they, why those things were sold that way. Like, why is the idea that you can count points and, you know, things like that? And as I got more into what I do for a career now, I come to realize that, you know, Jenny Craig, for example, is owned by Nestle. Weight Watchers was owned by Kraft Heinz for a very long time. Um, they still own steak in the frozen meal department for Weight Watchers. So these are essentially people who get to be like a drug dealer and the, the rehab center at the same time. So it's just sort of a chasing your tail for profit system there, right? So 
nobody makes nobody really makes money in the Whole Foods market. You know, it's not. I love that you said that. Yeah, that was like the greatest explanation I ever heard. It was like the drug dealer and the rehab at the same time. Yes. Yeah, like, let me ask you though, before we get too much into the getting fit thing, what was your favorite worst food? Taco Bell. Oh, I love Taco Bell. <laughs> Obviously, I I still got issues, right? So <laughs> I can't say much, but. No, when they came out with five buck boxes, I felt like a little piece of heaven just floated into my life, you Did know? It? Yeah. Um, I have not had it so... in two years and a month. Wow, that's so impressive. Yeah. But when you change a lifestyle, that kind of helps out a bunch, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. For so sure. Tell me, before you got into this, what kind of life did you live? Like, what does your work life look like? What does your family life look like? Because that's a lot of it, I think. A lot of people want to lose weight. They want to get healthy. But they feel like they have all these obstacles in front of them. Um, I mean, so what kind of obstacles did you have? I had myself <laughs> in the way that I think. <laughs> um, that was the bit. That was the obstacle. It's always the obstacle, right? All the other things, the family, the kid, the job, those are normal things. That's normal life. And I have to stop using that as an excuse. You know, um, we just, you know, with our clients here, like everyone just went through Easter recently and we had a lot of new clients. So this was kind of their first time working with us through their holidays. And, you know, to me, Easter is the, like, you know, the easiest of holidays, I feel like, out there. That it shouldn't be, like, the biggest challenge. But we'll make it a big challenge, you know. The, an addict loves loves holidays. An addict loves vacations. It loves birthdays and celebrations where we can be like, well, I'm going to make the exception. Or go in without a plan usually is where it goes wrong. But... To go back to your question, like, my thinking was always the biggest problem. My life, you know, after I had my son, typically, as a typical woman, like, that's when I gained even more weight, you know, and you're doing all the parenting thing, you're just even, you know, more sedentary, you just bird the child. Like, things are just, they just feel really relaxed. Like, there's no judgment. Everyone's just excited that there's this new little baby around, right? And you don't have to really okay. worry about yourself. You're changing diapers. You're making bottles. Like, you're doing so many things, right? Um, and uh, I thought that because I didn't gain any weight during my pregnancies, I, I had gestational diabetes. So I was on a really strict diet. I had to give myself insulin. I thought that that was going to be my big wake-up call. Like, I really thought I was going to get my health together after I had them, after having to give myself insulin. I didn't enjoy that. I <laughs> was not having fun with any of that but it wasn't it wasn't my wake-up call at all but mostly because my drinking was at the forefront i moved back to vegas when my son was one i got back into the party scene here but back to drinking hanging out in the same crowd um you know my addiction really started to strangle my life then i lost you know my cars were repossessed my business i had a marketing company was gone um my house went into foreclosure all of that then COVID happened um, and, you know, towards the tail end of COVID, uh, December of, of 2020, I, I quit drinking. And that was the first step in the right direction. Had I known what was in store, then I would have probably quit drinking way earlier. But um, I was seven months sober from cocaine and alcohol when I went into a doctor's appointment to have my liver enzymes looked at because I had one of those appointments and I'm sure you're familiar where they're like hey your liver looks a little weird how often do you drink and then like I proceed to lie like not very often at all so I knew it was <laughs> bad and I was wow I was gonna go have it looked at and while I was there she asked me if I was gonna do anything about my weight and I was like offended like what are you talking about like I don't have a weight problem I have a boyfriend <laughs> like that's the, that's the insanity <laughs> in my head right and um she said, if you've been able to be sober for seven months, you might be good at this. And she handed me a referral for weight loss surgery, which just doubled on my resentment of like, how dare her tell me, you know, at the body positivity movement, I grew up in it, right? I grew up in the test holidays and the torrid and it's okay. Like this sort of idea that health is a back seat um, to being, you know, accepted for your weight. And so I was offended. I was offended. And, but then I came to my senses, you know, and was like, well, maybe I'll explore this. Maybe I'll see. It was a six month program. I was going to have to go to meetings and, you know, see doctors and all of this stuff. So I started that process. Um, and then when it got closer, you know, I started telling people I was going to do it and telling people I was going to do it was really scary because that meant I was telling people I was fat. Cause I was very sure nobody knew that <laughs> because I'm so delusional up here. Right. 
And then I had the procedure and off it went from there. Wow. So it was just a lady handing you a pamphlet is basically yeah. what happened. That's what happened. I didn't and that's what opened the doors. It. I didn't, it never crossed my mind. I just, I fell into this idea that that's the easy way out. Um, I didn't understand obesity. I didn't understand it was a disease at the time. I just thought it was something I did to myself, brought on by myself. Um, and I'll yeah. there's some truth to that. But once you get to a certain point, without the assistance of the surgery um, or a GLP-1, it's incredibly challenging to get to a healthy weight and keep it there. Well, I, so Easter came around mm -hmm. and I ate the better part of my daughter's chocolate bunny, right? So when you say you, you were, you had been taught that this is a disease, yeah. what does that mean exactly? Like, what did you learn prior to the surgery? I'm not talking about afterwards, but yeah. prior to the surgery, there had to be lessons you learned where you were like, that's it. I'm sold. Um, just being in recovery from alcohol, I saw the parallels in the way I ate. Um, in the big book of AA, you know, we are taught to have candy available to the newcomer, right? Have it at the table, the chocolates. And that's fascinating because um, alcohol is, you know, a sugar at the end of the day. And we're just sort of feeding back into the same thing. I think that there's a lot of people who don't drink um, anymore and who don't use drugs anymore who have transferred to food. I think it's the hardest one out there to put to bed um, because you have to eat all the time, right? If I had to have a drink for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that would be a nightmare for me, like, to keep it together, you know? So I think food addiction, um, and depending on the study, like, we had a Dr. Vera Tarman, um, who's a food addiction specialist. We had her over in our community a couple weeks ago. And, you know, depending on the studies, anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the population in North America probably has food addiction. Um, which is a huge number. I get it. Huge number. Yeah, there's a lot of foods I feel like I'm addicted to. <laughs> you know? I wish I could jump on board with healthier. Like, I'm good with eating healthy, but I feel like I just can't get over that first hump. And I think that's a lot of what this bariatric uh, surgery and lifestyle kind of does. It gets you over that first hump, and, but you got to change a lot in oh, order yeah. to get there. Did you have any examples of it, like in friends or a network of people that you got to kind of walk this path with leading up to the surgery? So my sponsor at the time, she had had it and she had actually regained it. And it scared the crap out of me because she was somebody who had a significant amount of time in AA. And I thought, oh, my gosh, if she wasn't able to do it, I don't know how like a dummy like me is going to be able to figure that out. Right. And that really feared, put fear in my eyes. And I just thought, I got to figure out who I am at 175. That was always the number in my head, like 175. And I didn't know what she did. I didn't know how she acted. I didn't know how she eats. I don't know how she helped, you know, copes with stress. I don't know how she goes to parties and deals with boredom. Like, I don't know those things because food is tied to every single one of them. And I had to reinvent all of that. Yeah, I feel like I'm the same way with cigarettes, right? I was anyways, because I haven't smoked in almost two years now, but... He used it tied. I was tied to everything with cigarettes. So that's why I'm kind of putting those two things together, right? Because drugs, obviously, alcohol, obviously, you shouldn't be doing those all the time. But like with food and cigarettes, people don't look at you so dramatically if you're on, if you're eating too much or I'm smoking too much, you know? And so there's some, a lot of relatability, I think, in that and trying to fight that addiction. Yeah. It's hard. It's the hardest. Like I said, I'm not like, I'm not going to go hook up with some dude for a bag of Taco Bell. Like, that's probably not <laughs> happening. Tune up. You know? Yeah, I don't think I would either. But <laughs> let me ask you this, though. So, well, one, we got to tell everybody, what what would you, if you were going to describe what a sponsor is, what is a sponsor? Because you yeah, said so that back, in, in back when. a 12-step program, a sponsor is somebody who's going to guide you through the 12 steps of yeah. um, that program, the person you're, you're to go to, your mentor, whatever way you want to look at it. That's what that is. So we'll say mentor. Mentor is, like, I, I think, a good descriptive word. Um so as you know, I'm also part of those programs as well. So now, so you didn't have any kind of role models in the program. Not so you're doing this. No. So you're doing this all kind of blindfolded, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you know, all the details and you know, the specifics about it, but you're really going to live this lifestyle on your own. Once you decide to commit to it. Mm -hmm. right, that's crazy. What about, did you have a significant other at the time? No, not when I had the surgery. I broke up with him two weeks before the surgery. Um, gotcha. And so I was by myself for the beginning. Um, and, you know, dating and, and having weight loss surgery is a whole other topic. But 
Um, yeah, no, I was by myself. I did it by myself, you know, at the hospital. I, I was new into the program. I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, most of my friends were still drunk. Um, I think two people from the program visited me at the hospital. Like, that was it. I went home. I recovered. Um, my son's father helped me with their recovery. With, the recovery is not nothing. I, I had a C-section. Like, I would do uh, gastric sleeve, which is a surgery I had. I would do it 10 times again before I would be like, yeah, I'll do a C-section. Like, it's not a bad recovery. Oh, nice. All right. I, I, I don't think I would want, I, I don't think the, the, the C-section is pretty intense, dude. <laughs> you know, cutting the life out of you. So, uh, let's talk about what work goes into this. Oh yeah. Right. So what, what work did you have to put in before the surgery? Cause I know you had to prep yourself a bit, right? Did you have to lose some weight? Did you have to change your I diet? Not. So this is one of the, one of the fascinating things about weight loss surgery is that it's a very common procedure today. Um, and there's dozens and hundreds of centers across the United States that do it. Insurances, plans, most insurances will cover it. Um, there is very little post-op care, almost non-existent. Um, the insurance companies consider the post-op care to be preventative. So they don't, you know, they're already limited on how much money they want to spend on that. One of the biggest problems with this surgery is that there's no help afterwards. You go through this major thing and you are told to drink water and hit your protein goals and good luck and that is it um that is the end of it so the preparation to it is solely to appease the insurance companies um i didn't even know this until i was recently on a, a bariatric um a doctor's podcast last week i didn't realize that their dietitian is not covered by the insurance they have to fork that out um and so they don't make money having a dietitian on and like my dietitian, um, where I had my surgery here in Vegas, was really kind and nice, and probably like had a really great life. But she had never been fat. She had never thought like I did. Like it just there's this disconnect, you know. There's a uh. loss in translation because for the longest time, our doctors tell us to eat less and move more, and that's the problem. Once again, obesity is so complex. There's so many things going on. Um, once you cross that threshold of not of metabolic syndrome, whether, you know, high blood pressure, being overweight, having cardiovascular issues, type two, um, it's hard to pull it back. It does not happen just by simply changing the foods. Yeah, I think that's a great example of when I was deciding I wanted to get clean, I went to see a therapist who had never used before. I was like, you never lived in your car before. That's weird, dude. I don't even know how I'm supposed to talk to you. How do you find any relatability in me right now? You know, right? You probably think I'm some sort of nut job. Yeah. Because at that moment, I was a nut job, right? I was. I was just coming out of it, right? And I think you're saying the same thing. When you have someone that's never had a food addiction before, they don't know what that crazy they looks don't. like. And food addiction is not recognized by the DSM-5, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health. It's not recognized. I was about to say you um, have to break that yeah, down. Yeah, that's, that's the break. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, they don't recognize it, which means that insurances can't bill for it. So your bariatric doctor is not going to talk about it. Your therapist isn't going to talk about it. Your nutritionist isn't going to talk about it. The, there's a, I mean, the obvious speculation on why it hasn't been added. I mean, pornography addiction, social media addiction, um, video game addiction, all of these are in the DSM-5. Food addiction has not made it yet. And one of the other fascinating things that I've come to learn is that the food addiction or that the food industry is the tobacco industry. Philip Morris owns General Mills, which is one of the largest industrial. What? Yeah. <laughs> they bought it. No in wonder 90. there's all these extra ingredients in our food. They don't care. <laughs> no, no. So you can imagine there's a lot of money to not have this recognized um, because it means the insurance companies are going to have to fork over a lot of money, too, for that care. And what does that care look like? Yeah. And that's the, this is the hardest question for people to swallow is that care. Um, and I've come to believe mm. is practicing abstinence, abstinence from the food that is the problem, which tends to be salt, sugar, and fat combined. Um, dude, if I'm not, if you're not getting inspired right now, um, I'm not saying we have to commit to it, but if you're not getting inspired right now, I just literally thought to myself, like not everyone's going to smoke, yes. not everyone's going to drink, not everyone's going to use drugs. But everyone's got to eat. Yep. Right? So you put all this crap inside the foods, get people overweight, get people addicted to it, and then nobody supports the idea that that could happen. Yeah. It's just like free reign. It you is. You got the most addictive product in the world. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Honey Nut Cheerios or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know what General Mills yeah. is. I shouldn't have said that about it's- Honey Nut. But <laughs> it's crazy to me. Yeah, it is so fascinating. And, you know, then you look at the health market, right? Um, protein, high protein products have been at the forefront of what is out there right now. Like, you know, it was keto for the longest time. Now everything has protein, protein. And the bariatric community is sold much so on this because after surgery, you do have to focus on protein and it does usually come in a liquid form for the first couple of weeks, right? But not yeah. forever, by no means forever. But just you go into a gas station now and you see you have better options because there's Fairlife, right? Well, Fairlife is owned by Coca-Cola. There's Muscle Milk. They're owned by Pepsi. Oh. Premier Protein, they're owned by the people who make Fruity Pebbles at Post Holdings. Like it's all, all of it is the same. All of it is the same. Yeah. But if you, would you, obviously you would say muscle milk is a better option than a soda itself, do you think? I think protein powders and protein drinks are one of the most processed foods out there. You cannot make that. At really? Night. You cannot. A uh, protein no, is no. just like this excess like like uh, film that's on top of like milk and cheese that they pull off. They used to just toss it aside until the 80s when they learned that they can make it into like a protein shake. It used to just be trashed. Um and then you like if you let's use premier protein for example um they could have a thousand different flavors all the time and you look at the ingredients they're just incredibly full of artificial sweeteners which most people think is like sugar-free is a better option right um but the question is is it uh dr weiner from a pound of cheer he's the bariatric surgeon out of um, arizona he wrote this book called a pound of cure about eating whole foods after weight loss surgery and i love his example of, of explaining to people how artificial sweeteners work is that Every time you consume it, the tongue assumes that sugar, it, the tongue hasn't t- been able to tell that's not sugar. And mm-hmm. so your body starts to react, your hormones start to prepare for what's going to be an increase of sugar from the sweetness, and then nothing comes, right? And you end up becoming like the boy who cries wolf to your body. And this is what starts to change our hormones. And that's where the obesity came from, okay? People think weight loss surgery is about the restriction, that's not the case. If that was the case, the lap band would be this incredibly successful procedure out there. They don't even perform it anymore. Yeah. When you have weight loss surgery, your hormones are reset. The leptin, which is one of the most important hormones that tells your brain to tell the stomach that all the fat storages are full, stop. Mm-hmm. Most people who have insulin resistance have leptin resistance, which is why they can overeat and not feel the sensation of being full. And there are many of these chemicals um, like potassium benzoates that have like been linked to mice forming leptin resistancy. And that's a very common ingredient in diet soda. Um, anyway, so I could rant about that stuff all day. I think it's a better choice. Yeah, it's a better choice than the Pepsi. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the who needs a protein shake? Someone who just had weight loss surgery and somebody who's lifting. That's that's really it. Doesn't need to be does the average Joe trying to lose weight. Take that 200 calories and eat some real food. Yeah, I that's my, that's my goal in life, right? Someone gave me protein powder once, I swear to God, and it just stopped my entire body from doing anything. Did it? I like put it at a complete hole. Yeah, and I, I just had to I had to cut it out. Like, and I had to wait for my body to finally get rid of it. Like, it just didn't get rid of it. It was just it. Uh, it was terrible. But excess protein stores as fat. So if you don't burn it, it just stores as fat. Oh, I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Son of a gun, dude. What about um? Some of the things you've had to cut out, like right out the gate. Well, I've heard that from a lady that I worked with a long time ago at the radio station. She was a receptionist there. And she said, her doctor said, once you get the surgery, I mean, you could technically eat ice cream every day and you'd still lose weight, but eventually you're going to gain it all back. Yes. This is right. True. So in the beginning, you have a very small stomach, right? You're saying, and then uh, you cut out a lot of things. What are some of the things that you, you say you can, you're probably never going to want to eat again? Yeah. So I've not had fast food since my procedure. I just will not. Um, there are certain foods I've tried since my surgery that just don't make me feel good. And it's taken some time to get to the to, to understand that. I, I mean, i got to learn lessons the hard way like everybody. Um, what I look for today is if that food excites me in a way where I want to have another one and another one and another one, that it's probably not a food that I should be having. Um, you just reminded me of something and I want to say this because I forgot when I was originally rambling on just a second ago, it's cause I was trying to remember what I, you had brought up to me, but I broke up my meals into smaller portions 
right? And throughout the day. So I'd have my lunch, but I wouldn't eat it all at once. So I'd eat a little bit in the middle of the day. And then by the time the day was over, my lunch would be gone, right? But it was just a normal lunch. So then I started realizing that I was getting full super fast. Um, and then I would eat something I really like and I would get full and I would think, well, son of a gun, right? How am I supposed to eat the rest of this? Like, cause I don't want to stop eating it cause it tastes good. So that's food addiction right there, right? That is a hundred percent one of my problems. Yeah, I'm you know, doubting like, that. I'm doubting that food was like you know some broccoli or even strawberries. <laughs> you know, like no, it's always meat. Like I love meat, dude, and that's why when you said that if you eat too much meat, I've always thought as much protein as I can take in. That's what the media is saying to eat more protein. So, but now it's being stored as fat. This is ridiculous. I just burn myself pretty good, dude. I mean, I didn't think I was being healthy the whole time. Yeah. I overrate on meat. Yeah. I get meat sweats. Yeah. Now, I, I focus on protein first. Okay. And, uh, or sorry, protein first, protein first, meat second. Today, now, that's what I, I, anyone who has surgery, you have to go protein heavy. Your body is made up of water and proteins. And that's the focus at the beginning to make sure that oh. you're functioning correctly and all of that. You don't go into some sort of malnutrition stage or anything. But in the bariatric community, the protein products, become extreme to every meal is like that you start off with your profi which is this coffee protein combination and then you're having like you know a quest bar and then you're having maybe quest chips or a legendary bar i mean there's so many protein bars on the market today um and they're all they're just candy bars that happen to have protein added to them um which people don't quite understand that i mean snickers has one so i think like the message was clear but uh, they don't satisfy you they don't keep you full <laughs> the fiber is manufactured it's not a real fiber soluble corn fiber um it's not going to do the same thing as fruits mm -hmm. vegetables and lean cuts of protein but people don't like the idea of having to make these changes because it seems so incredibly inconvenient and i won't lie it absolutely is but until you used <laughs> to be 270 80 pounds you you might not understand what inconvenience is because I didn't realize how inconvenient my old weight was for me until it was gone. You know, I didn't. That was actually the next question I was going to have for you was comparable to what your interests were when you were at 270, comparable to what your interests are now at whatever way you are now. What are the differences in your lifestyle? So incredibly different. I enjoy going to the gym beforehand. The gym was like a form of punishment for being fat. Like that's all it felt like. <laughs> that was it, you know, unenjoyable hated it right now i can go to the gym i can run i can keep up with my kid like i can travel like i just the world treats you differently and i'm sure even as a former obese person i treated other obese people differently as well but when you're on the other side of it you're like holy shit this is a very unfair world that i've been walking yeah. around in. and you start to be like man what kind of doors did i keep closed for myself and is it not i wouldn't say it's necessarily because of my weight but because I don't have the confidence to think that I can do certain things or deserve certain things. Gotcha. So what else do you do? Like, tell me, break it down. Yep. I know you do all kinds of crazy things. I've, I've I mean, <laughs> been your friend for a minute now. Yeah, I so know, I know it's I not, know. I, you no. don't just only go to the gym. No, I know that's <laughs> enjoy your life. Gym. No, no, no. I meal prep. Um, that's a big part of my life today. Um, I like to do, you know, just be more active, hiking and all of that jazz. I love clothes. Like, I've never not liked clothes. I've always liked I've noticed. clothes. I've noticed. But, like, this is just, you know, now I can shop wherever I want, which is, like, a phenomenon for me. I love that, right? Um, you know, I, just being single again in this world, like, that's different. Um, I It's so, one of the things, like, you know, I know your recovery story because I've heard it a few times. But if you wanted to revisit that, you would have to go use again, right? Like that's how you revisit. Yeah. If I want to revisit it, I can go to the gym and pick up 115 pounds and try to walk with it. And Oh man, that's crazy. I simply it's so hard for me to do it. Like to actually walk with it, can I pick it up? Of course. Can I can I, you know, deadlift it out? I can deadlift it times 2. But like I cannot just like walk around with that. Like it's so hard to do. And that is a reminder to me every time. I have my clients do this all the time, especially when they're feeling down, like things aren't going as fast, you know, so they want them. I'm like, go pick up the 60 pounds you've lost. Just go revisit it really quickly. And like, yeah, 
Yeah. That's a great way to do that. That's a great breakdown. Yeah. It's a lot safer of a way, right? <laughs> than, than relapsing. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it depends on what your back is like. If you pick up 150 pounds with a bad back, yeah. you, know, you might have some issues. Yeah, this is true. But uh, so going to the gym, Um, I know. Do you go hiking? Yeah, I go biking. hiking. I know you ran a marathon, didn't I you? Did. No, I've, I've done a few 5Ks. Uh, I enjoy running. Running was something I started when I was seven months post-op from surgery. Um, I was only 200 pounds at the time, or I was 200 pounds time. I'm about 150 to 155, given the date nowadays. And um, I started running then. It wasn't like I just ran. I interval did interval running. So I would run a, a minute, walk three minutes, and then I, I did that consistently until it got me to running an entire 5K. Um, That's crazy. So I enjoy that. Those are fun parts of my life today, just being more adventurous than that. Yeah, I just don't know. I might, sometimes I'm like, I don't know if life started the day I quit drinking or life started, you know, seven months after the surgery, right? Like it's, yeah. I would never go back. And my heart always goes out to the clients we get who got to where I am at right now and then put it all back, you know? And the, the slope yeah. to that, the roadmap to that is long. If I get off this call with you and I pick up a drink, like my business will be gone in like a week. You know, my rent won't be like my apartment will be gone in two weeks. My car will be repossessed in three months. Right. CPS will be at my door in a few days. Like that's just it'll happen really quickly. That's what happens. But if I leave this call and I have Taco Bell. It doesn't go zero to 100 so quick. Right. It's a slow decline to get there. And but to come back up from it is even harder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So. Let's talk about your your work now. So if people wanted to visit you, let's say they wanted to get in on this, they decide they want to try bariatric surgery, or can they just kind of hit you up and see what you think about it? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Absolutely. How does it start off, the yeah. re relationship between you and your, your clients? So um, we have clients who are having surgery and clients who've had surgery, and then we have some clients who are not having surgery who just identify as having food addiction. Looking for an accountability and a community, I think those are key. Um, doing this by yourself uh, is I wouldn't I would not recommend it. You you got to have somebody, and it doesn't have to be me. It can be Overeaters Anonymous, you know, Food Addicts Anonymous. Um, there's other programs out there. Um, we offer what we offer is pretty unique um, in what we do. My clients in our group program and our one on one clients, like I look at their logs every day. I text with them every day. There is a every single day accountability seven days a week. They have like a lifeline to me um, and to our other coaches when they're struggling, like you have to create that friction because I, I'm typically the first real conversation they've ever had about food. Um, so over at bariatricrewrite.com, which is our website, we have a couple of different programs. We have a subscription program, which is like three weekly calls. It's great community space, great community. And then our group programs, we take them through a four month food addiction course, really kind of looking at all the avenues of life that need to be changed, how you act yep. socially how you clean your kitchen at night, like how you organize your food, like these tiny little things play a role in whether you're going to make a good choice the next morning, right? It's harder for me to want to make good choices in the morning when my kitchen's a disaster. I'm just not interested. Uber Eats, others go to the McDonald's breakfast drive through You know, those are like, that's where my brain always goes. That's easier and quicker. Yeah. Right? So you have to redo everything in your life. Yeah, or if somebody's like my mom is visiting right now, my brother's about to visit. My first thought when my mom got here, the first morning she woke up here is, "Hey, you want to go get some donuts?" <laughs> and then I thought to myself, "I have eggs, Kevin. Just get up and cook some eggs." You know. <laughs> I think one of the the biggest blessings for me being a single dad is the fact that I cook a lot more, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been broke lately, so that works out good. You know, <laughs> if you could buy, you know. A whole lot of chicken because chicken's the cheapest, you know, with some vegetables and, and cook those every day. I feel like I'm already starting to do better. So hearing everything that you've said so far, Chanel, I think that if anyone out there is thinking I need to lose weight, this doesn't seem as far fetched, but more likely seems like a realistic option. It is. Nobody has come back to us and or no one's ever come to us and said, I've regained my weight from eating fruits, vegetables and lean cuts of meat. It just hasn't happened. <laughs> That's not what happens. It's always you know, I went back to eating the way I used to eat, even in the small portions that I can have. It's still, there's a difference between calories and nutrition. Yeah. And I've seen it. I've seen people that have gotten the surgery and didn't have the right support, you know, and I think the support's kind of a big deal because it gets a little frustrating doing stuff on your own. And again, I have to salute you for the fact that you did it, 
And I think this is one of those situations, like me and you being both in the program, um, helping other people is kind of helping yourself because it's reminding you to do what you did to get there, right? And what you need to keep doing. Yep. And you feel like helping all these people is helping you stay in the position that yeah. you're at. Dude, I, th I think about like weird things sometimes. Like I have a pretty big following on TikTok and I'm not the most like fan favorite person for other bariatric creators. I think a lot of like consumers uh, uh, on bariatric TikTok stuff enjoy my content, but other creators not necessarily. Uh, and probably because I, I don't do the things that they do. I don't, you know, our business isn't thrived on pushing protein products on TikTok shops you know, um, discount codes to, to, you know, shit. Like that's just not, that's not what we do. Um, and a lot of people monetize TikTok in a negative way. Like they monetize yeah. it by making videos on eating fast food X amount of months at like, this is what I get at Taco Bell five months post-op. This sort of like toxic stuff in my opinion. So I always think where I'm going with this, that there's some people on TikTok who are not my friends. They just think I'm, I'm crazy. There's like, no way you can be eating like that. Uh, and I was like, man, when I'm out and about, like, I could never, like, slip up. Like, if someone caught me slipping up, I'd be, like, so, like, screwed over. But, like, not that I would, but, like, <laughs> yeah, right? my ego thinks that stuff, right? That And it just, like, like, fuel to my weird little fire on, like, just getting another 24 hours under my belt of not eating fast food, you know? And not yeah. eating, you know, potato chips and ice cream and cookies and donuts. Like, I just, that's all I'm doing today, you know? Absolutely. And I think... I need to get on this bandwagon already, dude. I, I every, every, everything that you're saying makes sense to me. I am absolutely a food addict. That is for sure. Uh, that's just saying that whole thing about me. I eat food and halfway through it, I'm already sad. I'm halfway through it. You know what I mean? Like that's an upsetting thing <laughs> to have happened. You're supposed to enjoy your meal and I'm upset. My meal's halfway gone. So if that's not a food addict, I don't know what is. Yeah, but no, is. I appreciate you being on your sale. So tell everybody one more time, like if they were going to get a hold of you, if they want to, if they want to just meet you and find out what a, this kind of lifestyle looks like, or it just in the support of wanting to lose weight, Absolutely. right? How would they get a hold of you? The bariatric rewrite.com. There is a coaching application you fill out. We actually sit down and talk to you for about an hour before we ever decide to work with you to make sure we can help you. Um, the other girl that works with us, Seta, she's five years post-op. Um, so we usually sit down together and hear your story and your struggles and go over what it is that we do and what makes the most sense if we're able to help you or not. There's some things I'm not going to be able to help you with. Anorexia, bulimia, those are psychological disorders. So we don't, you know, address those issues. But if you're having surgery, you're thinking about having surgery, or you just want to take a whole foods approach to life, go to the website, fill out the coaching application, schedule a free call to chat with us, and would love to hear your story. Awesome, Chanel. Well, thanks for being on my experience show today. Thank you, Kevin. Awesome. And you have yourself a wonderful day. And if anybody wants to check this out, we'll have the link information in the comments below or in the description below. Somewhere in there, the bee will take care of it. But uh, I just do the videos. Right? That's, all, that's all I do. They handle everything else. But again, we'll take care of that. And I hope you get to help a lot of people. I've been a part of uh, Chanel's life and recovery for about two years now. And I can tell you, if there's one person that's passionate about camaraderie, right? Or just wants to bring people together. It's Chanel. So even in the simplest fact of finding a friend and someone you can lean on when the time does become right, mm -hmm. I strongly suggest you look at Chanel and make sure at least you have her in the back pocket for the day that you want to commit to this thing. Yes. All right. I love it. So have a great day, Chanel. Yes, Thanks for coming on the show again. Bye.